I'm Lyndon Nichols, and I always have to pause between my first and second name because it sounds like Linda Nichols. Mm, so I'm Lyndon Nichols, and I live in Ballarat, Victoria. And uh, what do you do in Ballarat? <laughs> what do I do? I do many, many things, and I'm, I'm a person of many things, partly because I get excited about everything. And, um, and I go, oh, I want a bit of that. Oh, I've got to be doing that. Oh, that's interesting. So I, yeah, that's just me, I guess. I, I feel like I want to be involved in lots and lots of different things. And I think they will feed into each other. I remember a zoo project that we worked on together in Melbourne years ago, mm. where you were some kind of bird gathering lots of bits oh, and pieces I was and a, you had badges all over. Yep, I was a brush turkey and, um, <laughs> and brush turkeys make a mound, you see, uh, to put their eggs in and um, so I couldn't, in performance, I couldn't make a mound because, you know, I didn't want to trouble the gardeners to make a mound for me and would be in everybody's way. So I decided I'd make a mound out of stuff that the audience was carrying. So I go and, <laughs> so I nicked people's lunches and, you know, their cardigan and things like that, drink bottle and made a little pile of all those things and uh, did a sort of silly dance about accumulating things really and I had this really stupid costume on because I, I think it's funny, the brush turkeys, for months they make this mound. So it was sort of a take on, on the brush turkey and I gave everything back. But, um, Somebody from one of the funding bodies thought it was dreadful and it wasn't dance and how, you know, how could I do such a thing with dance money and, um, yeah. But the, my partner was Peter Trotman and he was a very beautiful brolga doing balancing on one leg and everything and I thought that was enough dance and, you know, <laughs> two sides of the one coin, I thought. Yes. Yeah. And then there was a shit-eating dog. A shit-eating dog? Yes. Was it David Wells? Was that David Wells being a cape hunting dog? Yes. Yes, and with a lot of rhythm. <laughs> yes, that's right. And we had um, a giant turtle dance, so a giant tortoise actually dance. That was good fun. And I had to have, you know, a particular face. And, well, like and there were some rather beautiful, elegant giraffes. Yes, uh, I obviously couldn't be a giraffe because I'm quite short. <laughs> so Sean Roberts and. Um, David Wells with a giraffe, mm. giraffes, and a flying otter dance. I was a flying otter on a trapeze in a tree. Um, that was quite good because I was trying to get the otter, the beauty of an otter in the water, which I couldn't really do on land. So it was that, you know, way of curving and being smooth, I suppose, in the space. Mm. And um, that, that, that whole project was the first dusk performances in the Melbourne Zoo. And, that, and that was in 1983, I think. And uh, since then, they've had lots of performances at dusk, you know, music and singing, opera singing and all sorts of things. And we were the first ones. And in fact, they, they were so unused to it that in the kangaroo dance, we were on what was called the kangaroo mound. It doesn't exist anymore. And, uh, you know, we were, this was the most literal dance. So we were, you know, really trying to move exactly like kangaroos. And we were resting at this particular moment, sort of leaning on our elbow like kangaroos sort of do, particularly in the zoo. And the sprinklers came on all over the mound. And so I sort of said, trying to not open my mouth, I said, oh, what do we do? <laughs> and uh, so we three kangaroos sort of discussed a plan of attack. The audience was quite dry, you know, watching us, and we'd been kangarooing for quite a while, so we decided, let's just hop away. <laughs> so, so we got up like a kangaroo, you know, and hopped off into the distance, totally wet. So <laughs> we had to sort of resolve that. It was an automatic sprinkler, but we'd forgotten, we didn't think about it, so we had to coordinate with the gardeners before the next show, yes, but that was quite amusing. <laughs> mm, never forget that. So, had you developed your animation practice before this um, performance, or did I, that come after? I, I ended up working at the zoo for about 18 years, like in different capacities. Those performances were the beginning of a long time working at the zoo, and it ended up 
a project working with disabled groups at the zoo and just having fun basically thinking about animals and looking at animals in a different way, in a way that wasn't in a more sensory, immediate way with kids who perhaps had um, found reading and writing difficult and understanding, you know, from a scientific point of view. So, so that was really terrific, but I found it artistically frustrating because um, I felt there was more in the animal world that I wanted to explore artistically. So I, and that's when I developed Animotions, um, which is a way of, what is Animotions? Um, it, I got a grant from Danceworks to uh, explore Animotions. And so I'd go to the zoo pretty much every day, that being the place where there was a wide range of animals with different um, different ways of experiencing their world and their environment. So I just sit there and watch and take notes and watch and then I go to the studio in the afternoon and just play with what I'd seen. And so what happened was I started to embody um, an attitude to the world which was more animal rather than human. So, um, and it was no words, so unspoken. It was, in a sense, irrational and illogical. And it's hard to be irrational and illogical in dance, I mean, um, or in movement. You can be, you can be non-verbal, but I think your, your movement choices, just as, you, as you're moving, even if you're improvising, there's a certain logical, rational thing that, that assists in making those decisions of, you know, whether or not to move off the spot or whatever it is that you're doing. And um, so, but because I'd sort of been immersed every morning with watching animals and, and sometimes it would be just watching an animal sleeping, you know, sometimes it would be doing what, when other people would come and go, oh, it's not bloody doing anything and they'd more, walk off to the next enclosure. I'd go, well, it certainly is, you know, watch it breathing or something. So, so I started to get very interested in just um, how an animal would, would be in a space. And sometimes animals do just seemingly illogical things to me because I am a, a logical person, you know. So, you know, for example, we've all seen this with pets. A, an animal might just suddenly, it might be asleep and then it just suddenly gets up and runs off out the front gate or something and and then suddenly stop and you know I don't know do something really different and so I started playing around with that in in my um, play in the studio that that was one of the elements and um, and then people then gradually I performed this work in in what I'd call an emotions mode of being and people afterwards would come up quite moved and they'd say oh, that was like pre-logic that was um pre-person you know or uh, very like essential sort of work and that's what I was aiming for because for me um dance I've been involved as a dancer you know ever since I was seven when I fell in love with ballet you know and I went through all sorts of different transformations of what type of dance I did um, and I loved it absolutely to the centre of my soul you know I liked the sensuality of it the feeling of it I liked performing obviously <laughs> um, and that's a whole interesting story why someone might like performing but um, and there's something about focusing my attention that I like performing that that's one of the biggest things not so much I want people to love me it's something to do with focusing my attention. But after a while, you know, I wasn't really interested in going to dance performances. I found them really boring. After about five minutes, I'd start looking at my watch. Um, and, but when I found Animotions, it, it, it connected me with an, something essential about the world. So, and I suppose for me that was something non-human because I think humans have mucked up the world to a certain extent. But it, but it connected me to very, well, to that wholly logical side 
um, of us as human beings and there's something that seems very essential, almost spiritual about that. So I started doing animations with a musician as well, quite a lot of work and we performed together and a lot. And um, oh, I've forgotten why. Yeah, anyway, so, so it sort of did develop a little bit. Um, I remember at the time um, we had a conversation about primal forms of the infinity sign, for example, oh, yeah. was very important. Yeah. And you you actually inspired me to go, I guess, that way in my own line animations. Oh, yeah. Right. To, to start using the circle, the spiral. Yeah. And the cross. And for me, the infinity sign is the cross. Oh, yeah. And I met a man who had studied the great apes in a, in a zoo in ah. Singapore. And he made it really, and, and young children. Yeah. And he made this connection between these primal forms. For example, X marks yeah. the spot in the sand. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And, and he observed the animals long enough to be able to confidently say that that's what that mm. meant. And that that's what we mean, too, as kids, when we do that. Do well, a similar um, gesture. Elephants, you know, poor bored elephants that, that are in a confined space will sway uh, from side to side usually and, and there's that sense of the infinity symbol in that too. And, and often in um, dance, uh, even, you know, what was then called modern dance and I suppose now contemporary dance exercises, that will be used, you know, the energy coming up the back of you and down through your centre and round through your pelvis and... In fact, when I was in, um, lived in California for a year in the early 80s, I enrolled in a Masters of uh, Creative Art at John F. Kennedy University and, and uh, I focused on the infinity symbol and did a paper and wrote on that. So I sort of looked into that quite a bit and how it related to dance and, yeah, it's a powerful symbol because I think... Um, Oh, well, you know, scientists talk about, um, what, astronomers or whatever, you know, time is curved and space is curved and uh, I think we, as humans, just get trapped in boxing things in places and sort of putting grid patterns over things and I just don't see the world like that. I see the world much more like this and everything influences everything else. <laughs>